We, uh, this last panel, uh, which we uh, will uh, attempt to expedite in an hour, uh, is focused on optimizing uh, resources. Um, and we've got three terrific uh, thinkers coming from different angles or different outlooks to uh, help us uh, get the conversation going. And I hope you all will uh, jump in at the right moment uh, soon, there at, soon in this conversation with your own comments um, and questions. Let me quickly introduce uh, the three speakers. And, uh, and then we'll come back to them for some quick opening remarks. Um, uh, Ken Thorpe in the, in the middle here, a professor and chair of the Department of Health uh, Policy and Management at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, a terrific uh, program, terrific university. Uh, he's chairman of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, a uh, very important coalitional effort, and he'll, uh, his opening remarks will concentrate on, uh, on, on chronic disease prevention uh, and private sector contributions and, and efforts along those lines. He's also uh, co-chair of the Partnership for the Future of Medicare. He's a PhD and MA, and he brings uh, uh, to this conversation today extensive experience on domestic health reform going, going back to the Clinton administration and that historic early phase uh, of, of effort at reforming our national health system. Uh, to his right is Murray Aitken, uh, uh, a, a BA from New Zealand, uh, an MBA from Harvard, uh, someone who comes, who is also the editor of Health IQ, uh, is with the IMS Institute for Health Health <coughs> Care Informatics. Um, he is uh, 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 someone who, really, his entire career has been around bringing a, a close analytic outlook to complex uh, healthcare issues, including the the issue that we've asked him to offer some quick opening remarks, which is about how the private sector, private companies can be most uh, enabling in opening access to medicines and technologies. Uh, he had 14 years of experience uh, with the McKinsey Group um, before uh, uh, moving to the IMS uh, Institute. And our third uh, uh, speaker today is Jesse Bump, uh, who's an assistant professor in the International um, uh, Health Department at Georgetown. Um, he is a PhD out of Johns Hopkins History of Medicine program, which we had a chance to talk about the, um, uh, earlier today. Uh, that, is a, that is a small community of folks who've left their marks in many different places, and so I was delighted to meet Jesse and that he could come and join us. Um, Jeff Sturchio comes out of that same program uh, at Penn, uh, and uh, is familiar to many of you. He's also an MPH out of Harvard, um, and worked at the, um, at the World Bank on the uh, River Blindness Project. So. Quite an interesting mix of a historical, an operational, and an analytic uh, outlook. And, um, and, and we've asked him to talk about the role of rationing in, in, in making uh, tough choices uh, in, in the case of universal health coverage. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and just kick things off. Ken, if you could open with a few minutes, and then we'll go to Murray and the Jesse, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, let things roll. Thank you. OK, well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Welcome to the uh, heavily coveted 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. session, uh, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, uh, so uh, we, this was actually our first choice. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, of, uh, just introductory uh, comments about uh, NCDs and, and chronic disease, because obviously we know the uh, huge burden that it plays in terms of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, uh, internationally, it accounts for about 60% of overall deaths that's expected to grow at well over 70 percent by 2020. But another role that it plays, and it's, it's germane to the discussion about uh, universal coverage, it is it's a key driver of rising uh, international and domestic health care expenditures. So in, in this country, uh, since the mid-1980s, uh, the rising prevalence of uh, chronic diseases in the United States accounts for about 80 percent of the growth in Medicare spending. And if you think of the framing of the discussion in this country about entitlement reform, that's really not a piece of, of the discussion. Uh, the statistics are, are growing and similar uh, in other parts of the country as well. And, and I think it has enormous implications for the design of systems because traditionally most of the systems that we've looked at internationally, and including the Medicare program here, are budgeted systems. 
uh, that the uh, way for uh, controlling health care costs is largely by simply managing expenditures by silos of expenditures, uh, the drug budget or the hospital budget and so on. And it's really ignored the major underlying drivers of why spending uh, in those uh, different uh, uh, sources and uses have been rising. So I think that just making the case about the cr critical role that uh, the rise in prevalence of chronic disease is playing, not only in terms of health outcomes, but in terms of cost, really does have some enormous uh, implications in how you really design health systems, but also how you design health insurance. So if you think of the Medicare program, you, make, you know, a single payer program of sorts, uh, it has Medicare Advantage programs in it as well, but you know that's a program that's really not designed very effectively to prevent the growth in chronic disease and certainly does very, very little in managing chronic disease. So it's not just an insurance discussion, it's really a design a discussion about how do we actually design uh, effective uh, health programs that not only fund things but also do a better job of managing and preventing chronic disease. So just really quickly, then I'll I'll move on to my, uh, my friends here who are flanking me. Um, is when I think about health reform in terms of you know, the real key components, yes, uh, moving towards expanded coverage has got to be a centerpiece of it because you have to have a mechanism to fund and pay for things and, and have access to care. But if you think about uh, the issues that I just talked about, that the growth in chronic disease is a major driver, virtually all the spending is associated with chronically ill patients. Uh, in this country, well over 80% of spending is linked to chronically ill patients. Uh, I think a health reform uh, discussion really needs to focus on three elements. How do we do a better job of, of averting disease in the, in the first place? How do we slow the growth and progression of chronic disease? How do we increase disease detection? Uh, in this country, we leave 25% of, of diabetics undiagnosed. In India, well over 60 million total diabetics, we're only diagnosing about half of those. Uh, so how can we improve our detection systems, and how do we do a better job of engaging patients and managing them to keep them healthier and keep them from uh, inappropriately using very scarce resources? But to me, that's sort of the core of a, of a health reform agenda, and I think as we go on and have a discussion uh, about it, uh, we spend a lot of time at the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease identifying best practice interventions that we know that work. And I think the challenge is two parts there, is identify those programs, and figure out how we can scale them and replicate them. And really focus on programs that we know that work, they're out there, uh, how do we identify them, and how do we engage both the public and private sector to make sure that those interventions are more widely used. And maybe as we go along in the discussion uh, throughout the panel, we can identify some of those uh, uh, best practice programs that we found that uh, are particularly effective. One trillion dollars. That's a number we haven't heard today yet. I'm surprised because it's uh, already three o'clock. But that's the amount that will be spent this year on drugs uh, globally. That's our estimate uh, of the total expenditure on pharmaceuticals of all types, uh, high priced, low priced, generic, branded, um, high quality, low quality. Uh, when you sum it all up, it's about a trillion dollars in total expenditure. Uh, so when we talk about optimizing resources, it strikes us that uh, optimizing that trillion dollar spend would be a, maybe a good place to start. And in the context of a discussion around universal health coverage, uh, there's a broader issue about how we do think about optimizing the total expenditure that's involved in providing coverage uh, for all globally. So of that trillion dollars in global spending, about 250 billion, uh, give or take, is being spent in countries with uh, GDP less than $25,000 per capita. Uh, and that amount is growing at about a 10 to 13 percent clip uh, and will continue uh, at that rate um, at least for the next five years or, or beyond. So one of the things that we've looked at is um, how would you know if in fact uh, that money is being spent uh, wisely. And we did some work uh, on a global basis trying to come at that issue uh, by starting by asking the question, when medicines are available and when they even are affordable, are they being used in such a way that they bring the greatest value to the healthcare system? And 
you know, part of this is around perhaps a, a notion of value leakage. What's the difference between the theoretical maximum value that that trillion dollars uh, could deliver to health systems and what is actually being delivered? And what are the causes of that uh, difference? Uh, and in our research, we found a pretty substantial uh, gap, value leakage gap, uh, coming from the way in which uh, medicines are actually being used or misused or uh, inappropriately used. We refer to the responsible use uh, of medicines, where that responsibility uh, is, is associated with the way in which patients use medicines and the way in which medicines are used uh, by healthcare professionals. So what we found was uh, in 2012, uh, we estimated that around $500 billion is, was spent across healthcare systems as a result of medicines that were available and were being used, but were being used in a suboptimal way. And to that extent, we would say it's a, it's a major uh, issue in terms of suboptimal use of the resources that are available. Uh, a big part of that relates to uh, patient non-adherence. Uh, when drugs are uh, being uh, made available uh, and are accessible to, to patients, uh, are they actually using them uh, as they should? Uh, we know that that's a big deal in, uh, in this country and, uh, and indeed in other developed countries. It's also a, a big issue for perhaps different reasons in uh, low and middle income countries. We looked at whether drugs are being uh, used at the right time in a patient's uh, treatment. Uh, and we looked specifically in the case of diabetes, but hep also hepatitis B, hepatitis C, where we know that the longer you wait to initiate treatment uh, with medicines, the more, the, the, the poorer the outcomes for the patient and the higher overall uh, cost for that patient. We looked at medication errors that get made, um, really across the various uh, healthcare professionals who get involved with uh, prescription drugs, prescribers, uh, those transcribing prescriptions, administering prescriptions, and so on. We looked at um, antibiotic use um, and overuse, misuse of antibiotics, which not only has uh, the effect that uh, that money is, is really being uh, wasted, but also triggers uh, additional costs in the healthcare system because of um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. We looked at the uh, suboptimal use of low-cost, safe generics that are available in markets where instead higher-cost uh, branded drugs uh, get used and, and put a quantification of the amount of resource that we would say is suboptimized in that area. And we also looked at the issue of uh, unmanaged polypharmacy, um, a growing issue given the prevalence of chronic diseases um, and and the, the situation where patients are taking five or more medicines uh, concurrently for different conditions and no one person is actually looking at uh, that totality of care for the patient, which in some cases uh, triggers uh, um, uh, you know, other consequences in terms of that patient care. So in this case, we um, I were able to identify, again, a pretty substantial economic impact on health systems from available medicines uh, not being used uh, responsibly. Uh, clearly, there's also a health consequence, uh, which, is, um, which is certainly important, although in the context of talking about resources, uh, sometimes keeping the focus on the dollars and cents uh, is a useful thing because it is the Minister of Finance uh, that has as much to do with universal health coverage as the, the Minister of Health. Uh, so we can talk about you know, other things that, that we've thought about in terms of what you can do to uh, improve the optimization of uh, resource allocation. But certainly in terms of that trillion dollars and in the, in the context of a discussion around universal health coverage and where that's going to lead us in terms of uh, medicine use. Uh, putting a, a, a clear uh, focus on the way in which the available resources are being used uh, is just as important, if not more important, than making sure that 
patients have access to the services uh, and that those services are affordable. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I, I want to start by saying that universal health coverage has this sort of intrinsic appeal, and as a brand name, that's why Ariel chose it over other competitors. It, it sounds good. And I want to submit to you that what it actually means is rationing, a word that nobody actually likes. And that's because when you're talking about the demand for health services, it's unlimited. There is no limit to how many health services people want and resources are finite. So that sets up an inescapable rationing problem. The way we tend to think of rationing in the States is like you go up to this window and then someone denies you a service. And actually, that's not the way most rationing happens. So when you're thinking about universal coverage, I want you to think of rationing and the mechanisms that are usually used to make it happen. I'll just tell you what those are. Before I do, let me take a guess. Your favorite rationing mechanism is time. Rationing by time would mean you guys get all the prizes because you wait around for the 3 o'clock panel, the much vaunted <laughs> 3 o'clock panel. And rationing by time is, that's what Americans think of when we talk about the Canadian healthcare system or the UK system. It's like they make you wait for services, and that's one way of rationing. Uh, we here in the States usually ration by price. We don't usually talk about it, but price is the underlying mechanism that decides who gets what. Distance or geography is another rationing mechanism. I just think about it, a hospital in downtown Washington, that sounds like a great idea to me and most people. It's not that meaningful by the time you get out toward Reston and when you're in West Virginia, it might as well be irrelevant. So where you put facilities determines who can get there easily and who can get what. That's distance or, or geography. We also ration by income. So think of this as Medicaid. You meet a certain income threshold, you, you get it, you, you don't, and you can buy yourself. Uh, we ration by age, so think of pro uh, programs for children or the elderly, um, S-CHIP, for instance, or um, uh, Medicare. We also ration by type of service or intervention or disease, meaning like we have treatments for this and those are covered, but we don't have treatments for X or Y or that we'll provide these services or not those services. Those are the, the sort of traditional things that you think of when you think of rationing, because you can get this, you can't get that. We also ration, and this is historically true and unfortunately still true, by a lot of ugly categories. So think of race, religion, um, prestige. We ration by things that don't make sense in a moral framework. These are all dimensions of rationing, and when you look at a health system, it uses all of them. They aren't, they aren't, it's not possible to escape them. So the question becomes, how do you manage these things in the best way? I'm not going to answer that. I'll leave it up to your questions. Thank you. OK. Um, I'm going to put a question out to our panelists. And I'd like to encourage all of you who are interested to come up with comments and questions while, while I do this. Earlier this morning, um, in that vivid session with Jim Kim, uh, there was a question that a gentleman from the NIH put forward, which was about, which was a sensitive issue around prices for drugs, and it was with reference to the HIV AIDS um, uh, debates over excess on antiretrovirals. And I thought Jim Kim's response was an extremely nuanced and balanced um, argument for dialogue and engagement. And for uh, bringing in the private sector into the uh, into the uh, uh, into the dialogue, and, and 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 building upon its stakes and interest in trying to find solutions that satisfied the questions around access, affordability, and quality, which seem to be the big themes that keep coming forward. That was one, I think, very um, encouraging moment from today. Uh, against a backdrop of, I think, um, a sort of uh, tension and contestation around the private sector's role as you look at universal health coverage expansion. I mean, earlier this year, Margaret Chan at a meeting in J June or May uh, uh, delivered a very caustic sort of categorical uh, critique of 
of, of industry uh, of, uh, 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 with respect to bever food, beverage, and pharmaceuticals, and, and, and did some equation of, of that with, with uh, uh, tobacco industry, which was, which was a very stark and dramatic statement. And it set off quite a flurry of conversations. And uh, the backdrop for that was, I believe, that the rise of NCDs and the expansion of universal health coverage is, in, is, is expanding the stake for all with respect to this. And it, if, there are, if there is latent mistrust or latent tensions or there are conflicts of interest of a var variety of kinds between public and private interests in our health systems, as you go through a period of expansion in this period where so much is at stake, you're going to see some sharpening of, of those expressions of tension at the same time that you're going to see the expressions like we saw with, with Jim Kim here today. So my question for our speakers is, at looking ahead in the net for the next three to five years, what are the kinds of steps that are going to be most constructive in light of these enduring tensions and, and clashes of interests between public and private sectors, multiplicity of private sector entities. What are the measures or principles that are going to allow for the best outcomes in terms of dialogues and constructive integration of public and private? Ken, could you offer some thoughts? Sure, th thanks for that softball. <laughs> um. Well, I, I, it's obviously, we've got to figure it out because if you look at uh, the data and statistics we've just been talking about, the way that we're going to prevent and manage chronic disease is through good primary care, the use of health care teams, uh, and appropriate medication management and use. So we've, we're going to have to figure it out, and it's going to take both the government and the private sector collaborating to do this. Um, I think one of the frameworks that I think is more important is making this transition from looking at just how much do we spend on drugs or how much we spend on hospitals to total spending. So for example, you know, if you, if you look at the profile of a typical patient, this is more of a US uh, example, that's driving all the costs in the system. It's an overweight, hypertensive diabetic with uh, bad cholesterol, asthma, back problems, pulmonary disease, and is depressed, <laughs> right? So, and they're on multiple medications, and nobody's really in charge of managing it, but we know if you had appropriate medication use, the total hospitalization rates are going to go down. So, I, I, you know, I, I worry that we focus too much on unit prices rather than worry about how do we redesign the system to get more efficiency out of it. Uh, I think, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s, having this silo-based way of thinking about it made sense because most of the spending was to treat uh, episodic, acutely ill patients. Well, that's not the deal anymore. That's not where the money is going. So uh, I think to the extent that, you know, we can develop uh, good dialogues between the public and private sector, we're going to have to do that. Uh, and I think that uh, if we're going to be effective at really transforming our delivery system and really building a prevention system uh, out there that's effective, that we're going to have to do a better job of collaborating and perhaps a little bit less finger pointing. Thank you, Murray. Yes, so uh, I mean, I would add to, to Ken's comments that uh, when it comes to chronic diseases um, in the developed world um, in the last few years, we've actually seen the cost of uh, treating those diseases with, with drugs decline. Uh, in the U.S., pretty significantly, the, the declines in the uh, Medicare Part D drug costs um, are, are quite striking. Um, now that's you know, partly because of patent expiries and, and a lack of uh, next generation uh, innovation in those disease areas. Uh, but I think it, 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 it makes the, the case, however, that the good news is that, for, that as we think about universal health coverage globally and we think about chronic diseases, uh, the good news is, is that the vast majority of patients are going to be treated very well by very inexpensive uh, uh, medicines. There are no patents any longer in, in most of the chronic disease areas. Now, there are still some patients who won't respond and, and will need uh, the, the, the more recent generation uh, versions of, of medicines, and there needs to be some allowance for that. But 
the, the vast majority of, um, of care is going to be provided as it is today by uh, relatively low cost uh, generic drugs. I think also the, the issue of the private sector, um, I think the last panel sort of picked up on this point, but I would sort of emphasize again that there is no one private sector. And sometimes I think people are talking about, um, you know, 20 multinational drug companies, uh, you know, representing the private sector. Um, when in fact we know that there are many parts to the private sector, most importantly uh, the delivery end of things um, in, uh, in, in, uh, around the world, uh, which, is, um, which is often very much based on the private sector. And certainly in the case of uh, medicines, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the private pharmacies uh, that, that tend to be a big factor in determining uh, how drugs are, are used and dispensed and also to some extent what they cost at the end of the day. So I think we've got to be careful about um, using the term private sector and, and being clear about which part of the private sector uh, we may be critiquing or, or uh, uh, commenting on. Um, I would also just say to Ken's point uh, also that the, you know, the, the siloed budgets uh, really don't help. I mean, you know, part of our uh, uh, advice to health ministers is actually get rid of the drug budget. Um, because it, once you have one, uh, it really does prevent you from thinking horizontally uh, from a disease area. And perhaps it's better uh, for there not to be any uh, drug budgets, in, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries. Jess. Yeah, and, and I added that once you have a drug budget, it's going to grow. Uh, they always do, uh, and they're out of control. So I agree, we, we shouldn't start them. Uh, but I'd like to, to add to the point that the private sector is heterogeneous. It, we as, as health people tend to look partly askance at the private sector, and I, I don't think that's appropriate. It, it's not like all private industry is like the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry is one with which the World Health Organization will not cooperate. They won't cooperate with the small arms industry, but they'll cooperate with almost anyone else. And I think that's the right model. The voluntary agreements in consumer product companies, food companies, beverage companies, just to reduce sodium, even by a few milligrams per serving, makes an enormous difference. So I see tremendous possible progress through cooperation with industry. And I think it's also worth noticing that if you want to deliver some intervention at scale, it is going to involve the private sector. The market reaches everywhere. And ultimately, the market responds to what people actually want. So if you can convince the public to want something else, then industry will follow. You can come around the other side and try to get industry to supply something else, too. So I see on both sides there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. And there's relatively little need for the oppositional thinking that characterizes most of our approaches. I think that is appropriate with tobacco, but there are not very many industries like that. Thanks. Why don't we open the floor for comments and, and questions? Uh, we have one hand here. We have one over here. We'll bundle comments and questions together. Thank you very much. Anna Melter, I'm a graduate from GW Global Health Program and recently has been working in Georgia, Republic of Georgia for two years and came back with my husband. I have a question about um, emerging uh, employee-based um, wellness programs, which is very popular in US, and how um, these programs can be, uh, I'm sure you can point it to the most successful programs exist now, how it can be um, taken as a model for developing um, market in developing countries or um, middle, middle income countries. Thank you. We have a hand over here. Um, Thayer Rosenberg from PSI. Um, we've touched on a bit today about the client's role in the systems that are being created, and each of you touched on it a bit more. I was wondering if you go into more about how clients need to be engaged in the system in terms of um, their own desires. Clients often want the biggest and the best products available, the biggest and best services. How do you manage those expectations? Um, clients that don't have resources, how do you manage those as well? excuse me, as well as um, making sure that they have a voice in the system and that they're 
they're able to speak to their own needs. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions at this time? Okay, why don't we come on, come back. Jesse, you want to start off? Uh, sure. W was your question about employers' programs for their workers? like prevention with uh, um, in regards of the chronic disease uh, I mean this is the uh, biggest issue now in the US is the emerging of chronic disease and uh, some employees like uh, I was reading about um, Johnson & Johnson one of the program like Walmart uh, and other insensitives I mean the employee basic employees are financing health insurance in the US and they're very interested to uh, create a healthier workforce and they doing different insensitives, like trying to give them uh, free memberships to the gym, trying to, to do insensitives for healthier um, eating, like uh, removing junk food from the workplace, etc. Right, okay, I know what you're talking about. Uh, so, I mean, that's the first part of the answer for me is historical. Like, in the U.S., jobs and healthcare are connected because of wage caps in World War II. You know, the companies couldn't pay their workers more, so they started adding benefits. Uh, Health care was one of them. I don't think that's a really good link. It's not a good link because it leaves out people who don't work for companies that are either large enough to do it or care enough to do it or whatever. You can't cover everyone if you have job-based insurance. So I'm, I'm going to dispute the premise uh, as a first step. But in the second step, once you have a population that you're caring for, whether you're a, a business or a health system, I think it makes tremendous sense to incentivize them to do what's right for them. Most of, uh, most of the ads you see on television for food and beverages, they encourage you to do things that ultimately are unhealthful for you, and it's no surprise that people go out and do them. I think turning the tables on that is a great idea, and the model that private industry has shown, incentives, uh, benefit plans, uh, lots of carrots, very few sticks, it seems to work fantastically. I think it's a great idea. Ken, you've done a lot of work on this. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's like anything, that how you put it together and design it's what really matters. Um, you know, there are good programs and they're really lousy programs. and. Um, I think that we, we have enough uh, information on what the good programs look like, and, and they, they are heavily uh, incentive-based. Uh, you're identifying uh, health risks, so you're, you're really working with people to do a health risk assessment and health appraisal. Uh, you're setting goals. Uh, you're making it easy for them uh, to, uh, to meet those goals, whether it's during lunch or having access to a nurse practitioner there at the work site to help you monitor uh, blood pressure, blood sugar levels, and so on. So, they can be very effective. I think you, you, we do have to be careful in designing them to make sure that everybody has the, the ability to participate in some way in setting goals uh, so that we're not just uh, self-selecting and focusing on healthier populations. But it certainly uh, it makes sense and it behooves employers to do it because for every buck that we spend on medical care costs through an employer, uh, they're losing four bucks on chronically ill patients in terms of productivity. So they, they have a huge economic incentive to really try to design it appropriately. Murray, can you speak to the client question that was put forward? Say, that's because clients say, I want antibiotics even though they might have a virus or something that's not gonna help them. So they have these expectations of what they want out of the healthcare system, and that might not be what's in the best interest of the healthcare system. Right, so certainly in the case of antibiotics, that's a, that's a very big issue. Um, and I think this, I mean, the, 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 the countries or, or programs that have actually tackled that issue um, have really, have come at it from a sort of community-based education, public health awareness kind of program um, to build awareness, particularly, specifically around antimicrobial resistance, uh, about the, about what diseases um, antibiotics are useful for and, and, and what conditions they're not very useful for. Um, so I think part of, this, and, and again, if we put it into the context of universe, universal health coverage and expansion of access, uh, there's an important uh, patient education element to all of this um, that has to be undertaken um, you know, by 
public health programs or community-based um, initi initiatives or even employer-based initiatives to, to link to the, the previous question, um, to build that awareness and understanding um, in the minds of patients so that uh, the healthcare professionals um, are more effective in, in the way in which they dispense their advice uh, to the patients and don't get the pushback uh, from the patient that, no, no, they want something that the healthcare professional doesn't think uh, is uh, necessary or uh, useful for that patient. Um, so I think this is where, um, as health systems evolve, um, the, the evolution of patient education and awareness is just as important as building the infrastructure and the capabilities on the healthcare professional side. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that, too, because I, I started talking about rationing mechanisms, and, of course, what you're asking about is a rationing question. So from a system design perspective, you want to avoid the case where the person presents knowing what they need, because then they'll always say, I need it, and I need more of it, and I want the expensive one. That's like personal behavior. So think of when you go to the doctor's office, and he says, well... Uh, you could have the brand name, uh, or I could give you this generic. And you're like, well, the brand name might be better. I'll take that one. Somebody else will pay. That's not a good ra rationing mechanism. So the rationing questions that I was offering, and this one that you present, these are really ethical questions. And the, the, probably the most straightforward way to answer it is you, you get people together who are in that system that's going to ration. So you say, like, all the people in the room, and they make a decision on what the outcome will be before they know their position in the game. That, that's called you know, John Rawls's veil of ignorance. And it's, it's a way of maintaining fairness through these really tricky questions. So that before you know the outcome, that is you know whether you're sick or not sick, you know what the fair thing will be to do for whatever that condition is. Thanks. We've had uh, a very long day and we've covered many, many um, subjects. We have one hand in the back here. Um, yes, sir. Last question. Uh, Emmanuel Pepper from the National Institutes of Health. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, just one question. I believe that, um, Murray, you had alluded to when you're talking to ministers of health, you tell them to really disregard the budget as in the drug budget. But in low to middle income settings, that might not necessarily be the case. So could you elaborate a little bit more on that point? Sorry, on, on the? Uh, just disregarding the drug budget, if you have a set aside budget. per se. So what would be another way to sort of work around that in a place where you have a limited amount of resources and you're trying to improve the health of that population per se? So the, the point that we would make is that if you look at the um, component elements of healthcare uh, in sort of vertical silos, then while you may uh, think you're optimizing for one particular vertical, you may be sub-optimizing uh, from the patient perspective or from the entire healthcare um, perspective. And that's, um, that's certainly true in the case of um, uh, most chronic diseases where there are very low-cost, effective uh, treatments or even preventions that are, that are possible that will help to um, avoid more significant costs due to complications and disease progression uh, down the line. So the issue on drug budgets is that if the goal of of uh, someone in the government is to minimize the drug budget or minimize the growth in the drug budget, um, that may or may not lead to the optimal um, allocation of resources across the healthcare system, um, and you may end up underspending uh, uh, on drugs and paying the price um, in other parts of the, the health system. So, you know, I overstate it to say you shouldn't have a drug budget. The, the, the real point is to be able to understand uh, from a disease state perspective what it's costing the health system um, uh, to manage that particular disease and the patients with those diseases. So let's you know, take diabetes, right? Every country should know what does diabetes cost the health system this year? What's the diabetes cost? They will struggle 
most countries, including this one, uh, will struggle to answer that question. But if you ask them how much do you spend on drugs, they'll give you a pretty precise answer. That, to me, we should flip that so that there's a clear understanding of the cost of diabetes uh, and, and a less clear uh, sense as to what the drug cost was. Yes, let me just follow up on that a little bit. I, I think about it this way, too. We know that uh, given the projections, let's, let's stay on our diabetes uh, theme here. We know that uh, under current trends, there's going to be a continued <clears throat> enormous increase in the prevalence of diabetes. Uh, so worldwide, in the United States, and so on. And certainly one of the ways to effectively manage diabetes is the use of appropriate medications to control blood sugar levels. So if I was, uh, and we had a very interesting discussion about four years ago, I went to Romania. I dealt with a guy who dealt with the drug budget. He didn't have any idea on anything else but what was being spent anywhere else in the system. He had the drug budget. His goal in his mind was to keep the drug budget growth slow, and small. And despite the fact that they have an enormous uh, underlying chronic disease pressures that are increasing the demand for medications to manage high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and so on. And they just raised the question on it's probably appropriate and desirable uh, to see a 10, 15 percent increase in the drug spend over the next couple of years because you're going to see offsets elsewhere in the system because the real question is not so much the components. The real question is what did the resource take out of GDP on health care? And to get them to broaden that question uh, to think about total spending is, is the way to go because you're going to see as, as populations change, as they age, as uh, chronic disease prevalence uh, shifts, you're going to see as you have innovation and in technology you're going to see big shifts in the component parts, as we have in the United States. I mean, in 1985, 1980, we spent about 40 percent of our health care spending was on inpatient hospital care. Well, it's 20 percent now. Uh, and it's largely because of technology and changes in the underlying clinical characteristics of patients. So I think that that silo-based approach to thinking about that is dangerous and, and, and inevitably could lead to really counterproductive uh, outcomes. Yes. This is the second or third time that I break my promise not to ask questions. <laughs> uh, but the question to the, to the panelists is, what is the role of women in all this discussion that we are having about universal coverage? If you look at the audience, it's mostly women. In some countries, uh, most of the physicians, if not all, are women. And we have seen that change uh, again uh, at home the health providers for the elderly, for people who are chronically sick, for children, are women. So I wonder what would be your, your approach to accept this reality? Because when we talk about uh, health providers, we forget the providers who are women and who work at home and work outside home. And if that is also part of the discussion or should be part of the discussion. Thank you. Well, I'm going to speak to that issue. You see, you've got to be careful here. So, of course, <laughs> I mean, most, most of the you know, long-term care services uh, provided in this country are provided off the books, so to speak, through informal caregiving. And it's largely by moms and daughters and uh, granddaughters and so on. So it's, it's an essential part of us effectively running our, our health care system. Um, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have a long-term health care system at all. Uh, it's not paid for formally, uh, but it's really sort of the uh, major component that holds together long-term care services uh, for sure. On the provider side, you know, we have in the United States seen a, somewhat of a shift in terms of uh, more women coming into, certainly on, on the physician side. But then again, if you look at, you know, who's doing all, all the caregiving in terms of nurses, nurse practitioners, it's, it's largely women. Um, we, we focus a lot on physicians, and that's, a, that's appropriate. Physicians diagnose, and they, and they provide uh, treatment options. But the types of patients that we're talking about here, for the 362 days of the year that they're not in a physician's office, the type of care that's being provided is being provided by nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, mental health workers, pharmacists, and so on, who are uh, more likely to be women than men. Thank you. What I'd like to do is ask 
our three speakers to close with thoughts around what are we going to be debating, what are we going to be most interested in talking about five years out, uh, and particularly with, with reference to the private sector, but not exclusive to that. I mean, where we have the benefit of a historian being on this panel, so Jesse, I'm going to ask you to sort of lead off because you've, you were t saying earlier that this, and I think this is very valid, that the historical outlook does lead you in certain directions. But we've also got Ken and Murray who have been analytically engaged in this, for, in this tracking of the trend lines now for 30 years. If you could also think critically around where do you think, given what we've heard over the course of the day, where do you think this leads us logically in, 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 in ex expecting what kind of, when we convene in five years time and take account of where we are and what are the most prominent issues with special reference to the private sector, what's that debate gonna look like? Jesse? Uh, so as a historian and an employee of Georgetown, I, I think I would have to go back to the time of Jesus to answer this. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding, okay. Um, it, look, for the last uh, 400 years, and now I'm serious, uh, the way the rich world relates to places that are now poor has been evolving in a long secular trend. That's the East India companies back in the age of domination. It's been evolving so that there's more power in what we call client or recipient countries than ever before. Like think of the proliferation in the number of aid agencies. You know, there used to be one the Mutual Security Agency. Uh, that became USAID. Uh, then there's, there's more. Now almost every country and its dog has an aid agency, and they compete with each other to give client countries something. Over the years, there has been this increase toward what you could call buyer power, if this is a marketplace. It's not clear exactly what the donors are competing for, but they are falling over themselves to do business, to give money, to give services, in many of the lower income countries. Businesses are at the same time trying to penetrate new markets. There's nothing new about these forces, they're just reaching new proportions. So I think in five years, we are gonna to want to talk more about the rules of the game. Right now, there is no regulation in the way rich countries operate in poor countries. They have different styles, they have different objectives, they have different outcomes, they operate in different ways and they seek different things. Businesses are increasingly responsible or at least linked to health outcomes. So think food, alcohol, tobacco, pharma. Major industries are playing an increasingly large role in the health of an enormous share of the world's population. So these two things both point at regulation. I think in five years we're gonna wanna talk more about that, about what international authority or international governance or international something can oversee this space. You've seen it evolve in currency and in trade with the WTO. We haven't seen it evolve in health. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is, you know, it's, it's a partial step in that direction. But I think that frontier has really yet to be explored. Thank you, Ken. Well, what I would hope for is if five years down the road, uh, sort of a major marker for me would be is how different does this healthcare system look like? Uh, how good of a job have we done really building a comprehensive prevention, detection, and care coordination management system? Uh, and to do that uh, is gonna take two things. One, it's gonna take uh, partnerships and coalitions. There, there, there's a thousand organizations out there. Uh, and we need to find ways to leverage the talent and have everybody sort of contribute what they can contribute to focus on really imp implementing more comprehensive strategies. Uh, using this country as an example, but it's really probably not that much different from what I've seen internationally as well. I think we have to have a, a change in focus from uh, doing pilot projects to actually implementing things at work. We have thousands of pilot projects. Uh, we have 20 years of accumulated data on things at work. I can tell you right now that internationally, we are not one pilot project away from a miracle, right? <laughs> so we need to, I think to the extent that we can t do targeted pilot projects to fill in the gaps of knowledge we don't have, fine. 
But I think we're hoping in five years that working both with government and with the private sector, that we have identified really effective ways to do vaccinations, tobacco cessation, lifestyle change. We have programs and interventions from randomized trials internationally on all of those that we know that work. I think we just need the leadership uh, focus to develop these coalitions and really change the mindset away from piloting to actually implementing broad systematic change, including health insurance coverage, obviously. But it really is the types of things that we're talking about here are much more public health, population health, the delivery of services, how we pay for them, in addition to simply uh, doing the insurance expansions. Thank you. Murray. So I think in five years we'll be um, asking the question, are we getting our money's worth uh, from the uh, expansion of funding for universal health coverage? I think that's a, a, a great question to be asked and I'm optimistic that actually there'll be some answers as to whether in fact we think we're getting our money's worth. Um, answers framed in terms of um, outcomes, um, answers framed in terms of quantitative measures of um, progress. So I think that, that that's one um, important topic five years from now. Um, a second topic that I would hope we're talking about in a positive way in five years, which really has not come up today, is how well have we used technology to accelerate the goals of universal healthcare coverage, uh, mobile health, um, the, the use of smartphones and so on. We know what the curves are like in terms of penetration of those devices. We know, again, there's a, there's a growing number of pilots about uh, how effective they can be in improving uh, quality and, and uh, access uh, around the world. Uh, but I think the question is to what extent have those been a central part of the expansion of, um, uh, uh, of, of healthcare coverage. Um, and I would say it should be a, a more significant part of the dialogue than um, has been the case today. And then I think the third point I hope we can discuss is the ways in which uh, domest the domestic private sector, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, has really evolved to become a critical and respected part of the healthcare system um, that is delivering value, uh, that is uh, competitive, that's regulated, uh, and which is delivering high quality um, service, but where we've had a, uh, you know, a sort of a, a generational shift, if you like, or advancement in terms of the uh, quality uh, and impact that the domestic um, private sector is playing, particularly in the low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Um, uh, Nellie and I would like to say a few words and just in closing. I want to, first of all, uh, particularly thank the people that are still here on CSIS staff who've given the entire day uh, to make this happen. Francis, thank you so much for being the photographer for the day. That's been invaluable. Schwinn, Brianna, Joe, Alicia, Matt. Uh, Matt, who was uh, very much the, the lead engineer. Alicia Kramer. Uh, there are many people here who uh, gave a lot of time and effort to pull all of this together, and I want to uh, uh, make a special thanks to you. Uh, Nellie, uh, was the visionary and the intellectual leader in this, Nellie Bristol, uh, and uh, even after getting thrown off her horse, stayed, got back up and, 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 and carried us to this day. And uh, Nellie, we're all very indebted to you for having brought us to this point. And I think, it, uh, uh, so please join me in thanking all of the folks from CSIS who did this. I don't know that I, uh, I mentioned Joe Jordan, who's our newest uh, senior staff person who's been with us here today. And Joe, thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite Nellie to say a few words of thanks to those who came a long distance and some a short distance, but gave us a lot of time and effort and thought uh, as speakers, as contributors, as moderators here. So Nellie, the floor is yours. Yes. Well, that's just what I wanted to say to the speakers. Thank you so much. You all came, some of you came from a long way. This exceeded my expectations and it was a great day and I'm glad I stayed for the three o'clock panel and I would have made you all the first panel if I could have, I just want you to know that. And, and to, thanks to Pharma for funding this, the project for the paper and the conference. 
and I hope we hope to do a lot more in this area and look forward to working with you. Thanks so much. So we're adjourned. Thank you.